Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Uh, I'll start again from a conceptual question. So please take a look at the question on the board. And uh, let's uh, take a few moments, read the question, please. And uh, uh, in a minute, I'll ask you to raise your hands uh, if you choose question, uh, sorry, answer A, B, C, or D. So that is about the uh, enclosed current that we need to put uh, on the right-hand side of Ampere's law. So we have uh, a cylindrical shell. Uh, we have two conductors, basically. One conductor here carries current I in the direction into the board. So it is uh, minus I. And, and then there is an outer shell uh, that uh, carries a total current I in the direction coming out of the board, which happens also to be the direction of the Z axis. Uh, now I am applying Ampere's law on a path C. It's a circular path, as you see. And uh, the question is, what is the current that I should put on the right-hand side of Ampere's law? So if I apply Ampere's law here on this uh, path, what is the enclosed current? Is it zero? Is it the second expression? Is it the third expression? Or is it two times i? Uh, so let's take a moment and uh, think about it. And then we will vote. So it's sort of a superposition of things we saw last week uh, with the solid cylindrical conductor and the cylindrical shell. OK, so let's take the vote. Uh, how many choose A? How many choose B? How many choose uh, C? Nobody. D? Nobody. So B wins. And uh, for the right reason, indeed, the total enclosed current will be, as you see, the path totally encloses uh, this conductor. That uh, current flows opposite to the a uh, positive sense of current flow that is defined by the right hand rule. So I'm using my right hand to trace the path. My right hand thumb then shows the direction of the positive current flow, which happens to be uh, exactly the direction of the uh, positive z axis. Uh, so therefore, this first current that is totally enclosed has to be included as minus i. And then the current that I'm enclosing here uh, from the cylindrical shell is only this portion, uh, which is and flows in the direction of the positive z-axis. So therefore, it is a positive current. Uh, so the portion of the current that is enclosed is uh, basically uh, the area that is included here, which is r squared minus b squared times pi uh, divided by the area of the cylindrical shell, which is this pi cancels out, and then you see that uh, the result is this uh, uh, answer b. Uh, so now I'd like to uh, continue with a few more examples on Ampere's law. Uh, and uh, the first example will be the solenoid, in fact, a tightly uh, wound solenoid like this. Um, your uh, textbook has this uh, diagram for um, the fields of a solenoid. Uh, it is uh, more appropriate to look at the uh, diagram on the right. Uh, so you see that uh, if there are air gaps, the magnetic flux lines can go outside. Um, and uh, then also they leak uh, outside from uh, the top and the bottom. Uh, so if I uh, assume that my uh, solenoid is actually very tightly wound, then uh, you can imagine a case where, in fact, these flux lines, so you see, if you start uh, just from a, a magnetic dipole like this, the flux lines will go like this. And they are closing like that. So then you put two of them together, 
the flux lines still will um, leak outside, so they will go to the surrounding free space through the openings. And now the case that I want to solve is actually uh, a very, very tightly wound solenoid like this. Okay, sort of like uh, the one that you see in this uh, picture, where you can actually see almost no openings. The wires uh, wrap around uh, the uh, cylinder that supports the solenoid, and therefore the magnetic flux lines just remain inside. They have nowhere to escape from. Uh, so in this case, the magnetic flux lines will tend to be along the z-axis and concentrated inside the solenoid. Uh, and uh, that is the case now that offers this enhanced symmetry that will allow me to apply, uh, to apply the Ampere law. So I'll go back to the board to make this case. So this is uh, the, uh, the solenoid. Imagine that uh, this, these gaps are really small. So if I want to find the direction of the B field or the H field inside this uh, solenoid, uh, I have uh, this situation where the wires come out of the board. from the top, come into the board from the bottom. The z-axis is somewhere in the middle. And um, I consider this to be infinite with n turns per unit length. Infinite simply means that I am considering the magnetic field of this structure very far from the edges. So I just don't consider what happens um, near the edges. And therefore, I can say for now that, let's say, this is an infinite solenoid. Uh, so the turns go like this, as you see. So the current uh, comes out of the board from the dots, goes into the board from the axis etc etc okay so now if you want to uh, guess what is the direction of the, of the magnetic field inside the solenoid uh, you can take a point like this and um, recall the biosavar law The Biot-Savart law tells you what is the magnetic flux of an elementary current produced at an observation point with position vector r. Uh, so r minus r prime is basically the distance vector between the elementary current and the observation point. So if I have this observation point, let's uh, uh, see the impact of the current right there, a small elementary wire on that uh, wire that comes out of the board. Uh, the Biot-Savart law tells me that it will be given by a cross product between the current and the, the current that comes out of the board and the distance vector. So it will be a vector that points uh, this way. So it will be pointing this way here. And then for every such current, there will be another current symmetrically placed so that the distance from the observation point will be the same. And now for this one, current uh, distance, I know this is a bit difficult. You may find the same conclusion uh, by 
using the argument with a stack of magnetic dipoles, just to guess the same thing, that the magnetic field will be in the z direction. But in any case, if you want to use the Biot-Savart law, the current comes out, distance vector this way, and therefore, the dB that the other one will create will be pointing this way. So then if you take the superposition of those two vectors, the vertical components will cancel uh, out mutually, and then the total magnetic field will be pointing in the z-axis. Will be pointing in the z-axis. So this is uh, one way to uh, confirm that the magnetic field will be along the z direction. The second thing to note here is that this structure, this solenoid, uh, has uh, certain symmetry. So the magnetic cylindrical symmetry For example, if you are somewhere here, you change your phi coordinate, which means that you are taking a circular uh, route around the z-axis. You see, no matter where you are looking above you, you see exactly the same current distribution. That means that the um, structure is cylindrically symmetric, and hence the fields cannot depend on the phi coordinate. So the fields cannot depend on the phi coordinate. Also, because I have considered this solenoid as infinite, as infinite, the fields cannot depend on the z coordinate either. So theta by theta z is also zero. And therefore, I have to conclude that uh, the magnetic field, both the magnetic flux density, the magnetic field intensity as well, points in the z direction and can only depend on the radial coordinate. So these are the two arguments. And then because I have this tightly uh, wound solenoid, I have the magnetic flux lines have nowhere to escape from, and therefore they will be just going along the z-axis like this. Let me just uh, try once more to mute the projector. Okay. So magnetic flux lines. They have nowhere to escape so the top and the bottom are just very far away and these gaps are so close to each other that practically the magnetic field is concentrated inside the solenoid. So this is the z-axis and the magnetic flux, once more. Maybe I'll power it off. Okay. And the magnetic flux lines are going along the z direction like this. And concentrated here, nowhere to escape, uh, and therefore there is no magnetic field outside this solenoid. We will see uh, also after we do boundary conditions uh, how we can really make sure that what, when we have solenoids like this, otherwise called electromagnets, because you are using a system of, with, of current wires to produce a magnetic field. So this is really the primary form of an electromagnet. Uh, how we can actually use magnetic materials to make sure that this picture is exactly true, that there is no leakage of magnetic field outside. So given these magnetic field lines here, any suggestions which path should I use to uh, 
uh, find this uh, only unknown. So you see, since I was able to express the magnetic field in terms of one unknown function of one unknown variable, now I can apply the Ampere law. This is the key. If I'm not able to do this, then Ampere law is not the right way to solve the problem. And you need to go to the Biot-Savart law. But now that I've done this, any ideas where to apply Ampere's law? Definitely, it won't be a circle this time, like in previous examples. But we have straight lines. So uh, the guiding example should be the last example we did with uh, the surface current on uh, the xy plane. Yes? That's right. So how about this line here? And uh, let me do it like this. And let's say this has length L. So I will apply Ampere's law in this path C. So you see that uh, there is only one non-zero contribution to this integral. And that comes only from this segment here. Along this segment, the magnetic field is normal to dl, so h dot dl is zero. Along this segment, there is no magnetic field because it has been trapped inside the solenoid. Along this segment, even here, again, we have the same thing. The dl is perpendicular to the magnetic field lines, so you get zero. So I have just one contribution to this integral, and that will be hz of r, if r is this distance from the z-axis, times uh, L. And that is really representative of what happens in Ampere's law. The integral has to be an easy one. If it's not an easy one, if the magnetic field is not constant along uh, the lines where you integrate, then the Ampere law is not the right way to do it. It has to be uh, an integral along the magnetic field lines or perpendicular to magnetic field lines. So you either get zero or you get something that looks like constant times length. And now we have the enclosed current. You see I have a length L here and I have N turns per unit length. So inside here, the number of turns is n times L. Of course, you can count here 5. But in general, for length L, having n turns per unit length, I have basically n times L turns. So what is my enclosed current? So the right hand side is I enclosed. Any guesses for the enclosed current? So positive direction of the current is, by the right hand rule, the outward direction. Therefore, I do enclose the current uh, lines with the positive uh, flowing in the positive current direction. So you see, I have here n times L wires. Each one of them carries current I. So the total current is n times L times I. And uh, that means that this uh, dummy variable that I introduced, the length L of my path cancels out. And I have that the magnetic field intensity is n times i. So you see, I control the magnetic field by uh, mortar, by I can increase the magnetic field of this electromagnet by increasing the number of turns per unit length. 
not just the raw number of turns, the number of turns per unit length, and the current density. So this is the magnetic field and the magnetic flux nu times n times i. So you see, in fact, uh, we assumed initially that the magnetic field could be a function of r. But in reality now, what Ampere's law tells us is that it is not even a function of r. It is a constant inside this magnetic field, and that makes it so appealing as an electromagnet, uh, as a component as well, let's say, of the MRI machines at hospitals, because you can uh, have a uniform uh, field that you are controlling through the current and the number of turns per unit length. OK, so this is uh, the first example. Uh, any questions on this? Yes. Why is the current enclosed on the vertical line of the contour zero? Oh, so we followed the path. Uh, the current enclosed is not, uh, is not defined along any segment. It's defined along this whole area. So this area encloses these wires. Okay. Imagine the wires that are cutting this area, there is n times L of them, and uh, each one carries current I. Oh, right? So the, maybe this picture is a bit more uh, helpful. Okay. So you see the wires are coming out. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? OK. Uh, in uh, the slide I, I showed before, there was also a, another uh, a type of uh, wire structure that generates a magnetic field, and it's very popular as an inductor, uh, and it's called the toroid. So the toroid is basically a solenoid that you are wrapping around a circle. So the toroid is Something like this, uh, you imagine you take the uh, solenoid and instead of having the wires along an axis, you are having the wires like this. Okay, so this is uh, now the toroid, and uh, we have an inner radius of the torus A and an outer radius of the torus B. So if you want to see the cross section of this toroid, which is uh, much easier to, to use when you apply Ampere's law, Here is how it looks like. And uh, you can compare this to you can compare this to the cross section of a solenoid. So instead of uh, having those wires along the axis, Uh, let's say we have uh, this uh, being the z-axis. Then I define an inner circle A, an outer circle B, and I'm wrapping the wire around it. So
So you see the wire comes out from this uh, point, then goes into this. So you can compare the three-dimensional uh, view that we have uh, on this side and the cross-section on this side. Completed. So that is now the toroid. Uh, and uh, let's say that we have here n wires of current I. Any ideas how the magnetic field lines would look like uh, here inside the toroid? So I'm interested in the magnetic field uh, inside from A to B. Yes. Uh, the z-axis. That's right. So imagine that you are getting these magnetic flux lines. Now you are wrapping the solenoid around. So you will be having phi directed flux lines. So the flux lines will be uh, following these circular paths. So in fact, going this way. So if you take this picture, you imagine that you are wrapping it around, then you will have these currents that are uh, coming out of the board, then going into the board, and they will be producing, just like those lines are producing this magnetic field that points in the z direction, this now will be producing those magnetic fields that will be circular, the magnetic flux lines that will be circular around the z axis. So now I can find this magnetic field. And again, I can uh, say that um, this magnetic field can only depend on R. You remember B is mu H, so therefore, uh, the two vectors uh, depend on the same coordinates and they are in the same direction because only uh, they are different only by a scalar. Uh, so the one depends on R, the other depends on R. The one is along phi, the other is along phi. So now what is uh, my Ampirian path to apply Ampere's law? Yeah, one of these circles, basically. So one of these circles. I go one in one of these circles. And I will apply Ampere's law. circular contour of radius r. So the magnetic field is constant when you fix r and you are on a circle, the magnetic field is constant. That's exactly what we have in Ampere's law. Always you have to integrate along segments that the magnetic field is either constant, it's zero, or perpendicular to the segment. So the integral has to be really simple. So then the left-hand side, h dot dl, will basically be h phi of r times 2 pi r. 
And now the uh, right hand side is the enclosed current. So how much is the enclosed current? Very similar to uh, the question we just did. So this is my path. This is the area. You see how the, there are end wires. They are coming out of the board. I'm tracing the path in the counterclockwise direction. So any ideas? How much is the enclosed current? So now I don't have wires per unit length. I have n wires. n times i. It's n times i. So I enclose all the current. All the wires are there. They are just uh, the same wires that emerge from the inner radius sink on the outer radius. But my path encloses basically all the wires. So the right hand side is n times i. So now I have a magnetic field that is n times i by 2 pi r. So not a constant anymore. It depends on the Distance from the axis. Okay, so this is now the toroid. Okay, this was my last example from Ampers Law. You have a question? Go ahead. Does that mean there will be no magnetic field outside of the toroid? So for now, I don't uh, compute the magnetic field, but you can tell that it, there won't be any other outside on the inner uh, be, um, uh, at r less than a because you enclose no current or outside because again the total current is zero yeah so i did the calculation here just inside but if you were to repeat that either outside the toroid at r greater than b or at r less than a then your right hand side would be zero because either inside or outside, the total current you are enclosing is zero. I can make a note here. With those two cases, so case one, and again, this is a good reminder of what enclosed current means. Enclosed current does not mean that there is current somewhere. It has to be cutting, the current lines have to be cutting the area that is enclosed by your path. So if you use a circle like this, the enclosed current is zero for R less than A because you have absolutely no wires there. And the second case, even if you are applying the Ampere law outside at R greater than B, you are in the same situation because now whatever currents are coming out from the inner radius, they are sinking into the outer radius. So the total current you are enclosing in uh, this second case, n times i minus n times i is still 0 for r greater than b. So in both cases, your right hand side would be 0. OK, uh, any other questions? All right. So then let me um, give you a little bit more information about the interaction of magnetic fields with magnetic materials. Uh, as you know, 
this board won't attract um, staples, just like uh, magnets do. Neither the walls, nor uh, you know, my chalk, nor anything plastic. So most materials are or nor are human our bodies. So most materials are non-magnetic. So that means they don't have any intrinsic magnetic field. An intrinsic magnetic field, when I say intrinsic, I mean like the bar magnets, that you take them from, you buy them from the store, and then you can use them to attract pieces of iron, staples, and so on, metallic uh, objects. Or uh, you can fix them on the fridge. So those things have an intrinsic magnetic field that uh, shows up with these magnetic properties of uh, forces that are applied on uh, other uh, metallic uh, typically bodies. So why most materials are non-magnetic? Uh, that is uh, the answer to this is that magnetic properties of matter are controlled by magnetic dipoles inside matter. And those magnetic dipoles are um, provided by, and we had a short discussion on this when we introduced the magnetic field intensity versus the magnetic flux density. So magnetic properties of matter are due to magnetic dipoles formed inside natural media. And these magnetic dipoles are formed because of the orbital and the spin motion of the electrons. So the orbital and the spin motion of electrons That is, if you have electrons that are moving like this, or electrons that have a spin motion, that is, as they are moving, they are also changing their axis uh, of rotation, and then their spin changes, all these things can be mapped to currents that uh, are flowing around the circular path. And therefore, they are akin to magnetic dipoles. And we know that magnetic dipoles uh, are producing magnetic fields. So this can be modeled as magnetic dipoles. And there are two things about magnetic dipoles that um, we should keep in mind when we are evaluating magnetic properties of matter. So magnetic dipoles. first of all, have their own magnetic field. We calculated that uh, last week. So a magnetic dipole like this has magnetic flux lines uh, one straight line through the center and then the other lines are circulating around. And uh, the second thing about magnetic dipoles is that in an external magnetic field, they are experiencing a torque. And uh, that torque, if the dipole has, let's say, a magnetic dipole moment M and comes into an external magnetic field B,
that will experience now a torque m cross b. You see that torque is a cross product between the magnetic dipole moment and the magnetic field. So that cross product is zero when the magnetic dipole moment is either parallel or anti-parallel to the magnetic field. So therefore, these magnetic dipole moments in an external magnetic field, they will try to align either in the direction or contrary to the direction of the magnetic field. So let's take this one by one. Most materials are non-magnetic. Why they are non-magnetic? Because Why? Because inside them, those magnetic dipole moments are randomly oriented. And being randomly oriented, they are producing magnetic fields that cancel each other. So the net magnetic field that comes out of wood, of plastic, of most materials is actually zero because of that. So they don't have any magnetic properties. So magnetic dipoles randomly oriented net B of the material is zero. So you cannot make a magnet out of wood and so on. Uh, and uh, even with an external magnet, you don't get uh, these to orient themselves uh, strongly enough so that you can get uh, something, uh, some magnetic field out of this. So what happens in magnets? So what is the other, I would say actually magnets here, uh, just so that we go directly to the other end of the spectrum. So we have most materials that have no magnetic properties. And let's go now to magnets. What happens in uh, magnets is that we have a strong orientation of the magnetic dipoles. So you have a medium uh, when you take a bar magnet like this, and this is the North Pole and this is the South Pole, which means that the magnetic field lines go from the North Pole to the South Pole outside the magnet. But as you learned, the magnetic field lines are closed, so therefore inside the magnet they will go the other way from the south to the north. So that is what happens in these magnetic media. Outside, they go from the north to the south, and then inside from the south to the north because they have to close. Okay? So how are these magnetic fields produced? They are being produced by strongly oriented magnetic dipoles. So somehow we have in these materials, because of their crystal structure, this strong orientation of magnetic dipoles. So the magnetic uh, dipoles are oriented all like this. And with that orientation, the magnetic flux that they are producing adds up. And hence, you have a residual now magnetic field that remains there, makes this magnet permanent, and hence is responsible for all these effects that we are observing when we are playing with magnets. So this is the north, this is the south. And now I'd like to answer the question, the original question that I posed 
when we started talking about magnetism, which is that uh, I introduced magnetism with the fundamental observable being that co-directional currents, as you will see also in lab three in more detail, co-directional currents uh, attract each other, contradirectional currents repel each other. So it's all about currents. It's all about wires. Uh, however, our experience with magnetism is through natural magnets. And that's how people actually, since the ancient times, uh, started looking into these uh, magnetic effects. So why do these uh, magnets, let's say if I have two magnets, this is north, this is south, and the second one comes here, again, north and south. Why do these two magnets attract? So they attract because they are magnets like this, because of the internal orientation of their dipole moments. So I have dipole moments oriented like this in the one magnet. And I have dipole moments oriented like this in the uh, other magnet. So you see that I have co-directional currents inside the magnet due to those magnetic dipoles. And hence, those co-directional currents will attract. And indeed, that is consistent with our observation that there will be an attractive force between the North and the South Pole. Attractive force between co-directional currents. So you see the fundamental observable that we presented is exactly the same as the observable uh, that uh, concerns natural media, natural uh, magnets. Again, we have attractive forces between uh, co-directional currents. And if we uh, turn around the second magnet, and now we have the um, still here north and south. Uh, but now on the other side, I, I bring the south pole and the north. So that means now I have inside here magnetic dipoles in the opposite orientation. generating magnetic flux lines inside from the south to the north, and again outside from the north to the south. So you see now I have currents that are contradirectional. And those currents will repel. And hence, we see a repulsive force between the magnets. So you see this picture reconciles the two effects, the one that we use to introduce magnetism as a fundamental observable, uh, which is that wires, when they are co-directional, they attract. When they are contradirectional, they repel. And the observable uh, on, of magnetism in natural media, which is that magnets uh, will repel if you bring the South Pole uh, to the South Pole or the North Pole to the North Pole, and will attract if you bring, bring South to North or North to South. Uh, so I will stop here for today, and uh, we'll continue with some more information about magnetic materials and how, how we make uh, permanent magnets, as well as um, magnetic cores, soft and hard magnets, uh, some things that uh, might be interesting for you, especially uh, if uh, you ever consider 
electric machines uh, that now are very fashionable with the electric cars uh, and uh, all these things are uh, used to be when I was a student not very interesting but now they are tremendously interesting because of uh, all this electric car industry. So thanks for your attention. See you uh, on Wednesday.